Welcome to the place where people of faith find real answers. We believe women deserve more than just religious band-aids for their most difficult and destructive relationships. And now for today's episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. We are talking to Eric Schumacher and Elise Fitzpatrick on their new book, Jesus and Gender. And if I could recommend you read one book on this topic, it would be this. It's fabulous. It's helpful. It's thought provoking. And I'm just so glad they're here to talk about it because for women who have been treated as less than and unworthy and not good enough and almost objectified in the Christian world Mm. as objects to use and not women to serve, women to love, women to partner with. It's time. It's time for a book like this. So thank you so much for writing it. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. We're happy to be with you today. Now, we talked before about worthy, celebrating the value of women, and now Jesus and gender. Worthy was a fabulous book as well, just talking about the worth of a woman and how God created male and female in his image, not just male and then females to help the male which is sort of the typical evangelical (laughs) viewpoint of the female. But both are created in God's image. But why are you so interested in this topic of gender and and the female in the gender picture of the Godhead? So tell us a little bit how you've grown in your thinking since Worthy. Actually, the, the genesis of the Book of Worthy really came out of Eric's study of uh, women in scripture who were the first to do significant things in the redemption's narrative. So then we really began to look at that and say, how does the Bible celebrate the value of women? But then off of that, then we had to say, then what? What's next? What kinds of things should we do or wait? What kind of ways should we think if in fact it's true that women are created in the image of God and are valuable. And <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like that should be such a leap for, in- for anybody, but it, it really is. So much of the gender conversation has to do with who gets to be the boss, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, later. But, you know, just, just remembering God created women in his image and because of that they have value absolutely and i and i think sometimes at least for the women that i work with more in the abuse population their conservative churches wouldn't say they're not valuable but they're valuable as helpmates they're valuable as servant helpers of the male so that the female itself the gender of female is only helpful as it serves the male um and i think you're challenging that a little bit. And so, you know, I think it's really interesting because we have these gender roles and the male has his place as leader and the female has her place as the helpmate or the helper of the male, but she doesn't have any significance of her own or any service of her own. And that's not true in the Bible. There's many women who served alone without a husband or just revolving their life around a man. Yeah. And and I think that that kind of mindset that you're talking about comes from a misunderstanding of what it means to be a helper. Often that can that can come down in marriage to she's there to serve the ambitions and the callings of her husband to help him in that. But in Genesis, the calling that she was a helper for was the Lord's calling to fill the earth and subdue it and to exercise dominion over it. And it was when the man was there that the Lord said, it's not good for him to be alone. That he, he cannot accomplish this uh, without the cooperation of a helper. And she comes along to join him, not in his ambitions or his interests, but to join him in what the Lord had put people on earth to do. And it I think that gets lost in those conversations so often. And that's where a a woman gets turned into a slave, which is not what a helper is. It's a strong ally that joins you and comes to your side and gives their strength so that you you can serve the task that the Lord has given um, and not your own. Yeah, I love that take on it because I do think it gets distorted in that, you know, she was created for him so mm. that whatever his needs are, are yeah. served by her, instead of both them serving together to honor God and fulfill God's purposes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly, you know, and, and it's that thought that as a woman, I don't have calling or value or gifting or purpose outside of how I'm doing something for a guy. And Leslie, you know me, I've been married for almost 50 years. It's not as though I don't think that I can be a help to my husband. I'm not saying that, but that I am a person and have value outside of that relationship with him. And I think recently we've even seen people saying things like, well, you know, the highest calling for a man is to be a father and a husband, and uh, you can't fulfill your highest calling unless you're married. Or I, And you know, as women, we've heard that for decades that you can't fulfill your highest calling unless you're married and have children and are in, submissive to somebody, and to which we have to just respond, well, wait a minute, Jesus was single. <laughs> uh, Paul, as far as we know, was single. How is it that we have so elevated marriage that women who are, as you well know, in abusive relationships will stay in those relationships, even though perhaps they should not, because they think that that's somehow God's highest calling in their life. Um, we've, we've got to rethink this as a church because women are being damaged. Men are being damaged. The reputation and witness of the church is damaged because somehow we've come to this thought that marriage is the whole point of everything. And it's not, well, there is a marriage that's the whole point of everything, but it's not this one. It's the one we have with the Lord. Yeah. And even the marriage relationship as it's described by these people who believe that is a very unhealthy system where the wife's role is really to enable the husband to do what he wants. <laughs> You right. know, that headship is described as you get to may have the final say and do what you want. And you're supposed to right. just support that wholeheartedly. And if you question that or challenge that, which is what a real helpmate does, right? Right. right. That if you're a helper of a leader, like the emperor's new clothes, if his helpers were really his helpers, they would have said, hey, you don't look so good naked, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they're right. just yes men. And, and if we're to be just a yes wife, you're wonderful, you're doing great, you know, yay you when he's driving the family straight off the cliff. Right. How is that really honoring Hebrews, where it says we're to encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If a woman can't have a voice, can't have a choice, can't give feedback that's instructive and encouraging because she's not allowed by God, that just doesn't fit with what the Bible says about women and about marriage and about relationships in general in the church. Amen. One of the things that we drive at in this book, Jesus and Gender, is the fact that Jesus is the only perfect human being. None of us as men and women are perfect, and he is the perfect image of God. And so he's the one who's carrying out the assignment perfect uh, with his bride, the church. And so to what it means to be fully human is found in looking at Jesus. And, and so we learn there how, through his example, how men and women should interact. And so when you have a husband who says, you're just here to do what I want and to serve me and my interests, um, that's not what Christ was like. He said, whoever would be great among you must be the least. He must be the servant to all because the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And the only description we have of what Paul means by headship is to lay down your life like Christ laid down his. It's to die so that she can be washed and so that she can flourish. Christ died on the cross so that his bride would be made new, would be set free from pain and tears and disease and, and would have an eternity of flourishing with him. And so anytime a husband 
is acting in a way that is contrary to his wife's flourishing, that causes her to wither up and to shrivel or to be damaged and unable to grow, he is he's acting as an antichrist because he is the exact opposite of who Jesus is as the bridegroom. Yeah, I, I think that's so powerful. I was teaching in my group recently and I said, I used a seed packet and I said, you know, inside this little seed, God created this seed to become a cucumber. But if it just stays a seed, it's never going to come into its full potential. But he created this seed hmm. to become a zinnia. And, you know, each person has got that inside where God put us, whoever we're to become. And when a husband decides, I don't like you as a zinnia, I want you to be a rose. Mm -hmm. And he squashes that zinnia or criticizes that zinnia. And she lets him because that's what she thinks is her, that he's become her God, that mm -hmm. his voice is louder than God's voice. And that's sort of the way that the church has structured submission mm -hmm. and headship. Yeah. Right? Not to flourish as each of its own kind, but you to be what I want you to be, to serve my interests. Mm. And I know, Leslie, that you have such a wonderful ministry to so many women, yes. friends of mine, who for decades were told by their pastors and counselors um, that they needed to stay in abusive situations and if they could just possibly be more submissive, that their abusive, misogynistic husband would somehow become Christ-like. I know that that thought for you, Leslie, that's the thing that calls you all the time to say, no, we're, we're going to stop saying that now. We have to stop saying that. We have to stop saying that to women. And I think that it just, it goes back to certainly not in, in the thought that every, that every pastor would have, or everybody who's a, you know, conservative complementarian would have certainly not, but there is something in that for some people that would say, yeah, because this is my right. She's made to submit to me and to be my helper, which means that I get to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I have a, a housekeeper, a slave, uh, a sex slave, and she has to do everything I tell her to do because otherwise she's disobeying God. And that, mm, yeah. that's got to change. Yeah, it really does. And so I appreciate that you're coming at it, not from the abuse perspective, but from the Bible's perspective of what does Jesus say about women? And, and I think, again, the, I had a conversation with a man at a church in Virginia, a pretty conservative church. And he says, but what about the role of women? And what about the role of men? And I think, again, we've gotten sidetracked on these roles yeah. that I don't even know the Bible cares about all that much, because if you fulfill your role as a husband, or you fulfill your role as a wife, that doesn't necessarily mean you still have a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. You might, you might be a great wife and still have a terrible marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I think where that, that word role could, could be helpful, but it's largely harmful. I think where it could be helpful is we think about uh, roles in terms of actors. We're called to play the role of, of Christ in the church. And when you look at how they love each other, it, it is amazing. Um, and, and, and essentially, this would probably sound heretical to some people, but both Christ and the church and both the bride and the groom are essentially called to do the same thing. Because when you talk about headship as laying down your life for the good of someone else, you're being called upon, uh, like Christ does in Philippians 2, to say, whatever strength I have, whatever gain I have, I'm not going to exploit this for my own good. Instead, I'm going to use this to voluntarily humble myself so that I can be a servant of somebody else so that they can flourish. And then what does submission mean but to say I'm willing to lay aside 
what I want. I'm not going to exploit that for myself. I want to cooperate with this other person in this task. So both the husband and the wife are called to not be selfish, mm -hmm. but to lay aside their own preferences to prefer the preferences of others, which is what Paul says is the mind of Christ, to consider others' uh, interests more important than your own. Sadly, what we've taken roles to mean is you don't get to be yourself. You have to play a part. And this part is a stereotype that is largely informed by things the Bible doesn't say and stereotypes about male and female. And, and then we, we take it way outside of even marriage in the church. And it's just applied to all men and all women and how they relate to each other. And it just becomes a great big mess because that's not what God ever intended. Well, you said men and women essentially don't have different natures. And I think this is like radical to the Christian community because it's been so like, we're completely different and, you know, men are very different than women. And so what do you mean by that? Like, are they the same? Do they have any differences or tell, tell us more, tell my audience more about that. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. That's such a good question because I think there's so much confusion in the Christian community about male nature, female nature. I, I think we have to start where the, we have to say what the Bible says, which basically is that male and female are created in the image of God. There is one nature, just one. So anytime you have people that say things like, uh, well, it's a, it's a female, a female nature, she's more easily deceived. She's going to always be a usurper. That's the way that her heart will be bent to sin. You know, deception and wanting to be the boss, those are things that run uh, through both male and female, men and women both struggle with that. But we can't say that there is a female nature that maybe is more emotional and, you know, doesn't really think very uh, clearly about abstract thought. And then there's this male nature, and the male nature is supposed to be um, really good at abstract thought and not so emotional. Then my question always to that always has to be, which nature did Jesus take? If we don't answer that question, if we say that, in fact, there's a male nature and a female nature, then you have to answer the question, what na nature did Jesus take? Because if Jesus only took a male nature, then women can't be saved. The only way that you and I are saved Leslie, as women, is because Jesus took our human nature, lived perfectly in our place, and then died substitutionally in our place, and then rose in our place. We have this one nature. Again, but if there are two natures, then, and one nature is kind of ditzy and more, more emotional then Adam is right when he says, why did you give her to me? Hmm. He's right when he asks that question. When he says, it's, your, it's the woman you gave me. He's right if, in fact, there are two different natures. And so what we want to say is, can we please just look at what the Bible says? And the Bible doesn't say we have different natures. Now, are there differences well, yeah, of course. I am biologically different than my husband. I know what it is to uh, menstruate. I know what it is to have children, to birth children. I know what it is to feed children from my body. That's not something Eric understands or will ever understand. I, I, even though he's been in uh, the birthing room with all five of his kids. His life has not been shaped by his biology in the way that my life has been shaped by my biology and his life has been shaped by his. So are there differences? Yes. We're not saying there are no differences. But when it comes to human nature, 
there is only one human nature. It's the nature we've been given as we've been created in the image of God. And so Genesis 2.24, how does that support that? So Genesis 2.24 tells us that, you know, the man will leave his mother and father and will then become unified with his wife and then together which we got to talk about that unity thing but then together they are naked and not ashamed they are the man and the wife together as one unit to fulfill god's call in their life but you see what's really important there is the unity that god says is the point the point that we have that we come together is is unity and if leslie if all of our discussion is about who gets to be boss Mm -hmm. we're not going to have unity Hmm. there will be no unity one way that i talk about this that i think might also shed light on our to our audience is you know when it says the image of god is male and female you know, it, he created he, them, male and female, in the image of God. So there is masculine and feminine. And when I used to ask pastors, I'd say, describe to me a spiritually mature man. And they would say, he's confident, he's bold, he's courageous, he's a leader, he's knowledgeable, he's rational, and he's humble and compassionate and loving. So they would include some female in there as Jesus had both very well. But here's the clincher. When you ask them to describe a spiritually mature woman, only feminine. She's Mm. submissive, she's loving, she's kind, Mm. she's gentle, she's no leadership, no bold, no confident. And there's something really wrong with that picture because the male, of course, to be mature would need to embrace the image of God that's feminine. And for the female to mature into the image of God, she must embrace part of the image of God that's masculine. And yet that's shamed for a female in our typical evangelical churches. You're too bossy. You don't know your place. Who do you think you are? Hmm. Hmm. Not because she's being sinful, but because she's being bold. Hmm. That is a wonderful observation. And I think you've put your finger right on one of the problems as we think about what it means to be a man or a woman. You know, going back to Jesus as the perfect image of God, you take all of those attributes that they've described for a mature man and a mature woman and ask the question, which one is not found in the man Jesus Christ? They're all there. And when the New Testament gives us instruction on sanctification and what it means to look like a mature Christian, it's we're we're not given gendered fruit of the spirit and we're not given gendered instructions on how to be femininely peaceful versus masculinely peaceful. We're just told to be at peace with people and be and like Jesus, be to like, be like God. Jesus. Yeah. Be, it's a, yeah. an amazing idea huh? that <laughs> to be conformed into the image of Christ. Yeah, and it's not an odd idea for a pastor to say that, yes, he needs to be more gentle, or yes, he needs to be more humble. But it's a very rare thing for a pastor to say, you need to pull your pants up, girl, and be more aggressive and assertive here, Mm. right? Mm. I've never heard that. And you need to say no to your husband, and you need to stand up for yourself. I've never heard that. Yeah, and anytime you see it in the scripture, it's typically said, well, that's because there were no men there to Mm -hmm. do it. And often the scripture in those contexts doesn't say that. That's just assumed they've brought that theology in. And that's that's not right. It occurs to me that one of the cases in point of this is in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. For those of your listeners who don't know, this is a couple who had decided beforehand that they were going to lie to the church. They were going to sell some uh, property and then lie to the church. So Ananias comes in and lies to Peter and says, um, yeah, I sold it for such and such an amount. And then he dies. And then his wife comes in and does the same thing. And she dies. Here's the point. She was as responsible to say no to him and to say, no, we're not going to do that. 
she was equally responsible. And so women should read a story like that and should say, God wants me to say no to my husband and he will hold me accountable if I don't. It's just so important for us to move away from those stereotypes that would say, well, and, and I'm sure you've heard it, Leslie. Well, you know, you just go ahead and follow your husband. And even though what he's doing is probably not good for the family and you probably shouldn't do it, but God will bless you because you're being submissive. That's absolutely wrong. I was at a women's retreat before I ever wrote a book. I did was a counselor, but I was at a women's retreat and a woman was a woman speaker was sharing a story of that, that a woman was pregnant. Her husband didn't want her to have the baby. They had already had a couple of kids. He wanted her to have an abortion. He was driving her to the abortion clinic and she was submitting and she had a spontaneous miscarriage. See, God provided for her. You know, she was mm. willing to submit to her husband. And, it, and I'm like, no, that's wrong. And I didn't want to humiliate her and stand up. Like, but it's so <laughs> hard because there is this kind of teaching that, you know, but when we look at scripture, you know, even with the Lord Jesus, when he was being hunted down by Herod, when Jesus was a baby and God woke Joseph up and said, take him out of here because he's in danger. He didn't just say, oh, submit to the authorities and I will take care of you. He said, go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, go. Yeah. Don't obey the authorities. Don't yes. listen. Go. Yes. And there is a place for a, a holy no. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've heard this, Leslie. I, I know I've heard this, and it's one of the saddest things in the world to hear is a woman who has finally gotten out of an abusive situation, and she says, I, I thought I was just being a submissive wife. Mm -hmm. And that just breaks your heart that women would be trapped in situations where they've been taught that submission means submitting themselves to harm and to abuse and to things that are life destroying and not God honoring that, you know, to submit to your husband as the church submits to Christ. When does Christ ever command us to sin? When does he work against our flourishing? When does he abuse us? When does he harm us? Never. Mm -hmm. And so to submit to a husband as the church submits to Christ cannot mean to submit in sin, in abuse, in harm, in unfaithfulness. The, the only thing the church submits to is what brings about our flourishing as people made into the image of Christ. I couldn't agree with you more. And yet you're right. They hear such opposite teaching. And I, you know, I'm happy that you've written this book that you can share with church leaders, hopefully who have misunderstood and valued maybe the sanctity of marriage more than the safety and the sanity of the individuals in it, or the well-being of the people to flourish in it. And, you know, some of the things I say to a woman, and this would go more along with your worthy book, but it's really important that you have an I, it's really important that you have a me, and it's really important that you have a no. And when yes. you don't have an I, mm -hmm. me, or no, you've lost your personhood. You've mm -hmm. lost the person that God's made you because mm -hmm. you were given an I and a me and a no and dying to self theologically yes. does not mean just like when the seed dies to itself as a, a seed and it becomes a cucumber, it doesn't become a nothing. Yeah. It becomes what it's supposed to become. Yes. And so I think for so long for the feminine and for the woman, dying to self has been sort of this theological uh, pathway to having a no self so that you can be more submissive and more objectified in the marriage mm. and in the church. Yeah. I, and I love how you made, you made that point about if you don't have a, what was it again? A no. And an I, I and a me and, and a no. <laughs> and I and a me and a no, then you've lost your personhood. And a marriage is a covenant between two persons. And if one of them is made into a non-person, the sanctity of marriage has not been guarded. Mm -hmm. and, and a church is not protecting and upholding the sanctity of marriage by protecting a relationship in which one person is depersoned and dehumanized. To protect the sanctity of marriage is to go in and to 
rebuke and address the one who is doing the dehumanizing, mm -hmm. the one who is stripping away personhood and agency and freedom and all those things, uh, because that's that's the opposite of who Jesus is. And 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 that person who's abusing the other one in those ways is breaking the marriage covenant. And and that needs to be addressed if we care about the sanctity of marriage at all. So if you were speaking in front of a pastor or a counselor who may be misthinking some of these things, thinking in old traditional ways about the role of a husband, the role of a wife, the importance of keeping the marriage together, sometimes even encouraging a woman to kind of lie and pretend that everything is fine when it's really not. What theological underpinnings would you most give them? Because I can say it from the counselor perspective, I can say it from the practical perspective, but as you know, as spiritual writers, as a pastor, as a theologian, what theological underpinnings would you most want to emphasize to them about the importance of really revising that point of view on men and women and relationships in the body of Christ? So, I, I mean, you have to start, I think, with the two commandments that we're given. Commandment number one is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. And you have to show me how it is that telling women they need to live in a, in a situation that would destroy them as persons, would destroy their personality, would harm their body, would harm their children. How is that loving your neighbor? How is that loving God and loving people who are created in the image of God? You know, I, again, it's very, very difficult to give up power when you've had it all along. <laughs> And to be able to hear the voice of someone else who might be saying, this feels like hatred to me. This is hatred. And, and then so many times, again, where I've heard that women are just told, well, just submit more. How is that loving? How is that loving counsel? I don't know, Eric, I'm, you're a pastor. I'm sure you'd have other things to say, but I just want to ask that question. How are you loving that, person's in, that person in front of you when you're telling that person that really the, the destruction that's happening to them is their fault? And not only that, but that if they're really a, love, a godly person, they're just going to stay in it. Hmm. I don't know how that's loving. Because yeah. Jesus went to the cross. You should too. <laughs> I'll add that because that's mm. what I hear. <laughs> yeah, mm. that is. That, there, there, I think there's just, that's a great question. And I think there's so many things that can be said there. And, and, and one that comes to mind is so often this paradigm of, of Christ and the church and the husband and the wife um, is used to justify so many things in marriage. And it's important to remember that that relational paradigm is that of Christ and the church as a marriage. There's other aspects of our relationship with God that is not compared to marriage at all. Uh, so God disciplines us because he loves us as sons, but that's not the paradigm put onto marriage. And so for a husband to be called to discipline his wife, which I've read about, there, there's you. no found, yeah. There's no foundation for that. There's that that relationship is not a father-child relationship. It's a husband-wife relationship, and 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 we're we're never told to model being a father and a son as a husband and a wife. Um, you know, being told to pretend like everything's okay. Um, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, you know, just this morning, I'm writing our church's liturgy for our worship service, and one of our readings is a psalm of lament. God inspires complaints for his people to put on their lips and tell him how unhappy they are and wonder why he's not doing anything. Like, the Holy Spirit inspired that. He, he does not want us to pretend that we're happy when we're not and that everything's okay when it's not. 
He invites us to tell him the truth. And when Jesus invites us to, to come to him, he invites those who are weary and heavy laden to come to him. And the reason is because he's gentle and he's lowly at heart. He invites them. He's, he's saying, it's safe to come to me. You don't have to worry about being harmed by me because I'm gentle and I'm lowly and my burden is light and I will give you rest. And so he invites us as his people and as his bride into an entirely safe context. And he never betrays that promise. It never becomes dangerous to come to Jesus. That doesn't mean life goes the way we want and, and all those things, but he is portrayed as someone who lays down his life so that we can have rest. And if anything you're doing as a husband or as a wife even is not that, you're promising rest, but you give slavery or torture, uh, you promise to be gentle, but you're harsh and you're cruel, then you're not like Christ. And that's whose image we're called to be conformed into. And that informs what it looks like to be a husband and to be a wife. And if, if that's not the case, then you're doing marriage wrong. Yeah, and I would, I would just jump in there and say you're sinning. Absolutely. You know, yes. And, and, I, and I know you believe that, Eric. But just to say, well, I'm a Christian man. I mean, I mean, how do you even know you're a Christian man? If, in fact, the way that you treat the primary neighbor that God has given you is with hatred and disrespect and harm, mm -hmm. what makes you even think you're a believer? Mm -hmm. Because the believer is to be known by love of neighbor. It's one thing for you to say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian man. It's another thing for you to actually love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm not saying we do it perfectly. Of, of course, all the caveats. Mm -hmm. But if a man isn't loving the neighbor, the closest neighbor God has given to him, and the neighbor who, in fact, he has the most influence over, if he's failing to love her and is, in fact, harming her, then I just want to ask the question, how you, how, upon what do you even base your boast that you're a Christian husband? Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes he isn't a Christian husband. And so that's mm -hmm. even given more, well, if he's not a Christian, then even more so should yeah. you stay with him so that you can win him right. without yeah. a word, that whole other right. theological yeah. piece, which we won't get into. But I so appreciate this, 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 this conversation, because I do think that actions speak louder than words. And I think that at least my experience often in the church has been that the actions of one toward another, whether it's a racial in, you know, injustice or a gender injustice, um, that can happen. We're all sinners. Mm -hmm. But when someone says, ouch, or stop, or that hurts, or wait a minute, I don't think the Bible teaches that. If you're a relatively healthy person, whether you're the pastor of that incident or you're the husband of that incident or the wife of that incident or the parent of that incident, and your kid says that, you stop for a moment and you pause mm -hmm. and you say, hmm, mm -hmm. is this, you know, is this the righteous man? Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, is this a gift from God to wake me up? And so, yes, there's going to be sin in all relationships, especially, you know, in closer to your list to them, there's more sin. But if there's no self-reflection and no willingness mm -hmm. to look at oneself, if it's just mm -hmm. entitlement, I'm entitled to treat you this way because mm -hmm. I'm the man, or I'm entitled to treat you this way because I'm white. I'm entitled to treat you this way mm -hmm. because I'm the pastor. Whatever it is, that entitlement mm -hmm. mindset is so toxic and it is indicative of not being a Christian, even if theologically mm -hmm you know the truth. But as Piper says, Satan knows the truth too. So yeah. it's not about knowing the truth. It's about living the truth. And so I'm so glad you close with that emphasis. If you don't love one another, especially the, your closest neighbor, and in ways that show that love, 
through mm-hmm. humility and kindness and servanthood, mm-hmm. then we have to question what your theology is. Hmm. Right. We can't say, well, I know I'm a Christian uh, because I love my neighbor. Well, we become Christians by the work of Jesus Christ. However, there is fruit there. And, and mm-hmm. if you are serially and habitually causing harm to your neighbor, then you've just got to ask yourself the question, how do I know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. I love that verse in Proverbs, where I think it's a really good description. First of all, the Proverbs 31 woman is a pretty strong woman. Yeah. She's independent. She <laughs> yes. makes her own income. She yes. makes her own decisions. She's got her me. She's got her I, and she's got her no there. Mm-hmm. Yes. But her husband, it says, he trusts her to mm-hmm. do him good, not harm. Mm -hmm. all the days of his life. And I think Mm -hmm. that's the essence of a healthy relationship, whether it's marriage or otherwise, that I can trust you not to do me harm, that I feel safe with you. Not that we always agree or that we, but we can even disagree and I can trust you to not do me harm. And so when we're in gender roles and one person gets to do harm under the whole topic of authority, Mm -hmm. which is a whole other piece of this, Mm -hmm. this misuse of authority, Mm -hmm. misunderstanding of authority and I get to harm you because I'm the boss or I'm an authority over you. I get to squash your I and your no and your me, even as a parent. Mm. I mean, if a parent squashed a child's no and Mm -hmm. me and no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to wear that. No, I don't want to eat that. Then Mm -hmm. they're not allowed to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Right. Right. I'm just thinking about the attitude of Jesus, even to Judas. Mm Mm-hmm. I I mean, he could have at any time just crushed him. He knew what he was going to do. And yet, what's the attitude of Christ? Hmm. He loves his neighbor. Not that he didn't know what he was going to do, but he's there with his at his meal with him. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, just learning to love our neighbor and none of us does it really all that well. On the other hand, we cannot excuse abuse because we have some skewed view of what it means to be the boss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else you want to share, Eric or Elise, before we go? I think, I don't think so. But thank you for having us on, Leslie. It's, it's been wonderful. And like Elise said earlier, we just so appreciate your ministry. You've been a great resource to our church and, and many women that I know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful, Leslie, because... I have friends who have been helped by you and for decades you've had this same message and you've stood faithfully and I I'm just thankful to call you my sister. Well, thank you. I've just appreciated your work Um, over the last two books has been so meaningful to my women to be validated and heard. Um, So many women, it's kind of like, Hagar in the wilderness and the yeah. man who sees, sees me and yeah. they have felt seen and they have felt heard and they have felt valued when they haven't felt that from a lot of other Christian leaders, they have felt that through your books. So I want to just thank you for writing them and thank you for being a part of this podcast. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Right now, I invite you to head over to leslievernick.com forward slash challenge to be part of our Moving Beyond Challenge that runs June 20th through June 24th. Learn how to move beyond overwhelm, negative thinking, and even the fear of failure. That's lesliebernick.com forward slash challenge. Well, until next time, may God bless your mind, your heart, and your home.